Hey everybody, and welcome to City Skate Brewing. I'm Dennis, and today, it's brew day. <laughs> today, we're gonna to be going through how to brew a recipe that I'm going to be doing from Bell's called Oberyn American Wheat Ale. You can find the recipe on their website, uh, but we'll go through what all that entails, what all the ingredients are, and then how to do it step-by-step step for those beginners in uh, all grain brewing, or even we'll touch on some aspects of uh, extract brewing as we go through the boil process too. But specifically, we're gonna be doing an all grain batch of the Oberon American Wheat Ale. We're gonna be doing a batch sparge with our mash, and then a batch sparge afterwards. And then we're gonna go through the whole step-by-step -step boil process all the way down to pitching our yeast. And so today, we're gonna to start by uh, milling our grains. We're gonna start our mash and then we'll go through uh, each step, step by step, and some tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. But the first and the most important rule about homebrewing is to enjoy a homebrew while homebrewing. Cheers. Now that that's out of the way, let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is crush grains using the barley crusher. Some of you will have kits that have grains already crushed, or you'll have that done at the homebrew store when you pick them up, perfectly fine. If you've opted to get a grain mill, we're gonna show you how to do that first. All right, for this step, I'm gonna be using the barley crusher here. I uh, put my drill on here, usually at a low speed. This one's on one of two. So it's not on the drilling speed, it's on usually the, the uh, number one setting, the slower speed. And we're not even gonna be hammering it all the way down. What we really are looking for is to get a fine crush, but not super fine where it's gonna clog your, uh, your mash. So the good rule of thumb, and you can look these up, it depends on each one of your grain crushers, but it's about the thickness of a credit card between your mills that are on the inside. So there's two, um, there's two wheels on the inside and the thickness where the grain falls between them should be about the thickness of a credit card. So you can use that kind of as a gauge um, but they also have some specifications on actual spacing um, to set those up. But those are for a different video. Today we're just gonna start getting ready and pouring our grains into the middle. All right, so we go about that. We're going to hold this one still, and we're again, we're not going to we're not going to crank it down as fast as it goes. The idea isn't to do it quickly; it's to do it correctly. And so, if you do it too quickly, sometimes the grain gets a little too fine. So, I like to go at an even, steady pace when I do this. So, I'm going to get started. All right, now that that is done, we're gonna go through and see what it looks like and show you guys what the grains should look like after they get crushed. So you want some powder and you want it to be pretty crushed, but as you can tell, there's some grain hulls that are still uh, visible in here. It's not completely sawdust. There is a good amount of chunks in there, but it's all broken up. You don't want any whole grains in there. You don't want any uh, leftover, but you want it pretty pretty fine, but not too fine where it's gonna uh, clog your mash ton when we get through the mash process. All right, now that all of our grains are done, we're gonna start the mash process. And the first thing that we need to do is figure out how much water we need to have in our mash ton, and then how much water we're gonna need uh, and how warm it's gonna be. And there's an easy calculator that you can do online and I use the one specifically from Brugger.com. That's B-R-E-W-G-R.com. There's a mash and sparge uh, calculator right on there. Um, I'll put the link below and you can type that in. That's the easiest and most um, accurate one that I found after I get done with my mash and what my boil volume is gonna be. Um, I use that one. So feel free to use a different uh, calculator if you want. There's a bunch of them online and different ones on different websites, um, but that's the one I use. Um, and it's gonna tell us that we need 4.1 uh, gallons to start with. And we're gonna need <clears throat> uh, that to be heated to about 163 degrees or so based on the grain temperature. So you also need to have that 
I just use a thermometer. I stick it in my grains. I find out the temperature of that. You plug that into the calculator online and then it tells you the amount of water you need and what temperature you need to heat it to to specifically hit your mash temperature. Our mash temperature for this particular batch is gonna be 150 degrees. And we'll go through, once that's actually through the mash, about what, uh, why that, uh, that range matters between, uh, you know, anywhere between about 145 to about 155, 160 degrees. is heating up uh, we just started it on the propane um, if you had a different pot that you needed to put in your temperature gauge you could also just slide that in the lip on the top of the kettle here in my case I have a temperature gauge right here on the front and so we're gonna wait till that gets up to 163 degrees and uh, and we'll be ready to mash in while your mash is heating up mash water is heating up it's a good idea to pull your yeast if you're using liquid yeast from the refrigerator. You'll want to give that some time to warm up. You'll want to shake it a little bit. If you have a smack pack, which has a pouch in the middle of it, you'll go ahead and you'll, you'll break that now, start getting that uh, enzymes working around, and then you'll need to let it sit out and get about room temperature. Uh, by the time we get done brewing today, it should be about there and be ready to pitch. Uh, today, we're going to be using the harvested cultured yeast that I used from the Bells Oberon. I got a different video on how to do that and what uh, steps I took to actually harvest and culture their yeast from their bottles in the link below. So if you missed that video, go check it out. All right, guys, our water's heated up to 163 degrees. We're going to quickly dump that into our mash tun, and then we're going to add our grains in there and get those stirred up and take a temperature reading, and we're going to try to hit our 150 degree uh, mark that we're shooting for uh, for our mash temperature. So let's go ahead and get that started. All right, I'm going to take my kettle, I'm gonna dump that guy right in here. And make sure that valve is off on the front of your mash tun. I already did that for me. So we're going to get that all in there. And then we're going to add our grains that we just moved up to the mash. I like to pour about half of them in there and stir it around real good. Make sure there's no dough balls when you're mashing in. So you don't want any dough balls in there forming. They'll look like uh, just big balls of clumped up uh, mash, or excuse me, mill, no uh, malt, excuse me. Dump the rest of that in there. And then we're gonna take a quick temperature reading to make sure that we have the correct mash temperature. We're trying to hit 150 degrees. I'd like to err on the side of being hot because you can always mix this up, keep the lid off for a little bit, or even add an ice cube or two to lower the temperature. It's really difficult to add hot water to get the temperature to raise more. So if it's a little bit hot, I, I, I'd rather have that than a little bit cool. So when you're heating up your water, err on the hot side, not on the cold side. Um, but this calculator that you use online should be pretty accurate. So we're gonna go ahead now and just get a reading on what that looks like. I like to move it around a little bit, see where we're at with the temperature. Again, shooting for 150. Just kind of keep that stir in while it's counting up. And we're right at, right at 150, perfectly. So when we get that lid on there as fast as we can, and it's gonna help keep the, the uh, temperature controlled for the next 60 minutes. So this mash now is gonna sit for an hour. We're gonna set our timer, um, and then we're gonna be right back in an hour. I like to stir this about one time in between, but towards the latter end. And then I'm gonna show you some tr tips and tricks on how to tell if this is done, if you're really trying to uh, hurry this along and you're trying to do a quicker brew day, there is a way to tell that the starches are converted to sugars faster. So stay tuned. All right, so we have our mash in the mash tun. It's at 150 degrees and it's sitting for an hour. 
but what is it doing inside the mash tun? And I don't claim to be an expert, but this is how I understand the process that's going on inside of your mash tun. So your, all of your grains have starches on them. And what the hot water is doing is it's converting those starches to sugars. And the sugars is what is gonna allow the yeast that you put it at the end to eat all of those sugars and create alcohol. But why the mash temperature? And that's a super important part of the brew process is the appropriate temperature of when you mash because 145 to 158, you can't miss that mark. Um, anything below 150-ish range is your beta enzymes and everything above uh, about 155-ish or 153-ish is your alpha enzymes. And so there's a sweet spot right in between there, uh, between about 150, uh, maybe a little bit lower than that, 148, 150, and all the way up to about 155, 156, uh, maybe even as far as up to 158. And it depends on what type of beer that you're brewing and how you specifically want that beer to turn out. If it's supposed to be a little bit a thicker feeling mouthfeel, you want that to be on the, a little bit on the higher side. If you want it to be a kind of more crisp, refreshing uh, um, mouthfeel, and, and it should be more like a, an ale like we're brewing here, it should be more like the 150, maybe even a step down. Um, a lot of brewers use 152, 153 range because that hits both of them, right? So it kind of creates a, a malty feeling and uh, a crisp, uh, uh, taste at the same time because you're kind of in the in the middle of that range and that's why that mash temperature is super important so you want to make sure that you're getting those mash uh, temperatures on target and the better you become at doing that the better brewer you become okay so here's a little bit of the mash fluid it's a little bit of the starchy water that's in there i pulled right away after i put this in here and then i have a little bit of iodine tincture that i was able to just pick up at like walgreens and it's going to show what this looks like when you drop it in here um, if the starches have not yet been um, converted. So you're just going to take this and drop it in there. And if you can see, the iodine is dark colored. See that? So it's, it's really dark. You can tell that it, it uh, um, you can tell that it's really turning dark in there. That means that there are starches present in this and the iodine isn't turning any colors. All right, so it's been an hour now about, and we're gonna check it to see if our starches have been fully converted into sugars. And the first time we did the iodine test, it actually turned a real purple, purple color. Um, if our starches have been completely converted into sugars, you might have a little bit of brown color, but it definitely should not be like a purple color, like an iodine color. So let's see what it looks like. We're gonna take a little drop in there. Okay, and I don't know if you guys can tell at home, uh, but you can see where the iodine drops in, but it's definitely not turning to like an iodine color, like a blue. It's staying like a brown color. And that's how you can tell that it's been converted to sugars. So when you mix it up here, you're not seeing any purplish colors uh, going in there. It's just all like a brown color. And that's just the, the tincture, you can see where it is, but definitely not uh, iodine color, like a purple, like an ink color. Um, and so I think our conversion is ready and we can start the Vorloff. All right, guys, our 60 minute mash is complete. And so now we're gonna do a step called Vorloffing. But it's important to note that between this, I needed to get ready and heat up enough water for my sparge because as soon as we get done getting all of the liquid out of here, which will be, be your, uh, um, your wort, uh, you're gonna need to be adding that hot water already. So I put uh, 4.5 gallons of sparge water at about 170 degrees. That's in this other Rubbermaid container staying that hot. I just put it a couple degrees ahead, of uh, more than that. And then we're gonna dump that back on top of the grains to soak for an additional 20 minutes to kind of help rinse the grains. But for now, this uh, first initial mash rest is done and we're going to do a process called Vorloffing where we're gonna uh, create the grain bed that will only let out the liquid and not any of the grains. So it'll keep those in the, in the, uh, uh, the cooler. All right, so what I've done here is I've actually added a high heat piece of silicon tubing to the nipple here that's on my mash tun. And I'm going to be running a little bit of that liquid out into a container um, because the first little bit that's gonna come out of here is gonna have some grains 
uh, in the liquid. And then the rest of it, we're gonna put right into our boil kettle. So I'm gonna take that, set it right next to the Vorloff container here. I just kind of use a large glass pitcher, but you can use just about anything. And uh, I'm gonna slowly open up the valve for this and let it start running. You don't wanna open it all the way. You wanna get it, uh, the grains to kind of slowly come down and create a grain bed around the screen that's in the inside of the mash tun. So I'm gonna let that come out until it's about halfway to three quarters of the way full of this. You can kind of see what I'm doing here. It's running out and then it kind of run, starts running clear. And that when that happens, it means none of the grains are kind of making it through the, the screen and that the grains have created you know, a, a grain bed themselves and are screening all of that uh, material out. So I'm gonna do this about three quarters of the way full of this. And this is a two liter container. So you get just a little under like a liter and a half or so. And then I'm gonna just pinch this off because this is flexible and I'm gonna put it right in my kettle. And I'm not gonna open this up fully yet. Um, I'm just gonna let it kind of go at its, at its normal rate and it's looking very clear. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the rest of this and I'm gonna gently pour it into the mash tun again. And so I'll show you what I'm doing here. So here's our mash. You can see here, I'm gonna be pouring this just gently back in here and I'm gonna kind of try to do it on the sides of the container. You don't wanna dump it all the way back in or it can create like a, uh, a pathway right down into that grain bed. So you just wanna gently pour this back into your mash tun, just like I'm doing here. Just kind of slowly pour that back in here along the sides. Okay. And then we're gonna let the rest of that get into the boil kettle. You can see that's filling up here. And apparently uh, we will see how much we uh, gain off of that. And once we've uh, gotten all of the liquid out of this, we will pour in the sparge water, which we have sitting in this Rubbermaid cooler, again, at about 170 degrees and we'll let that rest again for 20 minutes. All right, so we just got about two and a half gallons, maybe a little under in there. And according to our uh, calculator online that we did with the water, it tells you what you should have about approximately uh, for your first runnings. And it said we should have 2.44, so we're right on where we need to be. That's considered our first runnings. We're gonna leave that in the kettle, but we're gonna dump in the 170 degrees sparge water into the um, the mash tun again and let that rest. So you're, if you looked in our thing, we have our grain bed down here. Um, you can see there's no fluid in there. That's all been drained out. I'm gonna close, make sure you close the valve back again so you're not running it into our kettle any longer. So if you pour that um, sparge water in there, that that's not gonna happen. I'm gonna go ahead and dump our sparge water that good mix. And the reason I do that mix is because I do add some uh, water additions and for this purpose I'm not going through that but uh, you'll may do that in the future. I add them to both my my mash water and my sparge water ahead of time. So all right I'm gonna dump this is about four and a half gallons at about 170 degrees. Dump that right in there. going to give this a good mixing again. So we want to get those grains off the bottom, away from the screen that's on the bottom. And essentially what this is going to do is going to rinse the grains out of the, or rinse the grains from any leftover sugars and stuff and complete our full boil volume that we need to start boiling the beer. So we're going to uh, put that on there. Again, the temperature is less important. It should be a little bit higher this time, but it's less important for your uh, sparge water. Um, averages about 170 degrees. That's what we're shooting for today. We're going to let that sit for about 20 minutes. And we'll come back, give it a good stir. We're going to vorl off again, and then we're going to get to our full boil volume and start our boil. All right, here we are again. Uh, it's been 20 minutes. We're going to vorl off the second amount. I opened it up, I stirred it really, really good, get those grains mixed around again, and now we're gonna get the rest of our volume uh, into our boil kettle. 
So I'm gonna go ahead again, just like I did last time, and I'm gonna vorl off, off the first three quarters or so of this uh, pitcher. Now open it up slightly. I open it up about a, just under halfway to start to see where we're at. Again, you don't wanna open it up all the way or you can get what they call a stuck sparge, which means a lot of the grains uh, collect on really fast onto the screen and it sticks and it's really difficult to get out. So uh, fortunately I haven't had to deal with that a lot, but there, I have done it before and it, it's a pain in the butt. So the slower the better, I think. And then again, when this starts running clear, I am going to transfer it. I'm just gonna pinch this hose or you can close it, one of the two. And then I'm gonna transfer this right into here. And it'll start going into the boil kettle now. And then again, same like I did last time, I'm just gonna dump this back in very carefully into the uh, mash tun uh, to let it recirculate. And again, just rinse all the grains down. When this gets done, I should have about six and a half gallons or so to start the boil. All right, so we've calculated just under seven gallons of beer. We're gonna get this thing started boiling and uh, we're gonna check our starting gravity to see where we're at after we've uh, gotten all the sugar water, uh, basically our, our wort into our boil kettle, see where we're at, okay? Let's get the boil started. All right, guys, we are done with the mash. We're done with the sparge. And this is where you would be at if you were extract brewing. You'd be starting to heat up your water. You'd be putting in some of the grains in a muslin bag, and you'd be uh, soaking those until it got to about 170, 180 degrees, uh, and you started boiling. And then you would be adding some type of dry malt extract, whether it be a dry bag or sometimes, again, a liquid malt extract comes in more like a syrup container. And you'd be pouring that into your uh, mash or your full boil uh, or even on the stove top to get what we just did with the mash which is you know getting all the sugar water essentially ready for the boil so it's heating up right now on the on the burner um, and we're gonna let that do its thing and I'm gonna show you how to take a gravity reading and so there I take a started what I call a starting gravity reading and then there is an original gravity reading that I'll take after we get done with the boil and the volume has been uh, lowered and the difference between that this just helps me see what my efficiency is uh, for brewing so Comparison to the grain. There's a uh, calculators online that will tell you your efficiency uh, If you take a gravity reading at this point, so not necessary to take a gravity reading But since I have a hydrometer, I'm going to show you guys how to use that I'm going to do that twice today once now and then once after the boil once the volume is at its level that will be in the fermenter um, and we'll take two gravity readings now is also a really good time to start cleaning and sanitizing your fermenters if you haven't done that already. So I did that in advance. I have a fermenter that's ready to go with sanitizer in it um, and ready to be uh, filled with uh, wort after the boil. And so if you haven't done that, we've got to boil this for an hour. Now's a great time to get that started or do that well. It's boiling. And we'll uh, once it gets closer to the boil uh, volume, or excuse me, the boil temperature, uh, I'm gonna also add a little bit of firm cap and we'll do that in a minute. But in a, for now, we're gonna show you how to use this uh, uh, hydrometer. So again, uh, you can take this, it comes with a little syringe thing or you can use a different one. I, I took a little sample of the beer before it started really warming up, or not beer, wort at this point, before it started warming up. And all we gotta do is add a couple of drops on this little screen and then close this over the top and then you can take a reading through it to see where your starting gravity is. So we're gonna go ahead and take a little bit of that volume. I'm gonna put that right on the top of this little blue area for the, for the screen. We're gonna close that. And what it's basically gonna do is give me a volume of where I should be pre level. It looks like I'm at about 1.046, okay? So I'm gonna show you what that looks like um, and I'll take a little picture and I'll post it on the video of what that looks like um, looking through here. It also gives you the bricks reading on one side and a starting gravity wart on the other side. Uh, so I also keep a brew log, it's really important to do that. Um, I'll show an example of what that looks like as well. And that's something that you can record all of these on 
uh, including your whole brew day so you keep stats so next time you brew if you brew the same beer you can kind of see where you were and did yours match the original recipe that you started with or if you're doing your own recipe where did you hit where was your gravities at after your boil etc so it's a good uh, thing to keep a log of these um, it's quick to write this stuff down and I like using the refractometer because the uh, you only have to use a couple of drops of the wort and not fill up a whole uh, cylinder like you do for a regular hydrometer reading so I uh, recommend getting one of these if you if you don't have one and we will see where we're at once we get closer to boil all right so the kettle is getting pretty close to boiling you can see there's a little cap of foam that's kind of developing on the top that's totally normal and to uh, prevent that from boiling over as it gets really high I add a couple of drops of this firm cap on here so that actually you should add about a teaspoon or so but if you notice when I drop this in, just a couple of drops of that, it will actually start to dissipate that foam layer a little bit. I've also added my hop spider, which is this thing. This will keep some of the hop material out. That's not necessary to do, uh, but it'll help keep some of that hop from coming in uh, and getting into my troop at the end. Some people love to just leave it in. I like to use the hop spider, but to reach their own. Um, as we get closer to it boiling, which it's probably about there, and it's one to two degrees, or actually about way from boiling, you can see it kind of starting to roll now. Uh, you're gonna see that uh, this will start rising up a little bit. You might have to stir it to keep the foam cap down a little bit. And that's what that, that uh, firm cap actually does, is keep that from overflowing as you get closer to the boil. So, once this thing also gets to a boil, we're gonna add our first hop addition, which in this case is pearl hops, and that will be our 60-minute bittering hop addition. So uh, give that a good stir, make sure that fern cap is in there, make sure it's not gonna boil over. I also like to stir inside of this thing, both with and without hops in it, just to get that moving around. And once I get a good rolling boil, that's when we start the timer for 60 minutes for our boil and when we add our first hop addition. So I have my first bag of hops right here. This is pearl hops. And I'm gonna go ahead and add those now. But first, before I do that, I'm gonna turn down the volume of, or turn down the uh, burner just a little bit here. Because we really just need to sustain a boil. It should be a rolling boil, but it doesn't need to be a super, super fast uh, boil. You should want it uh, you know, moving pretty good. You don't want it to be just trickle boil. Uh, but like this volume is about right uh, and movement in the in the kettle anyway. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna add this. You also, when you add hops, you really need to look at how close um, it is to boiling over because adding hops will create boil over sometimes. And so you really wanna be cognizant of that. That's also what the firm cap helps prevent too. So um, it's boiling pretty good. I'm gonna actually turn that down just a little bit more. And then we're gonna go ahead and add our first round of hops, pearl hops again, one ounce, 60 minutes. Go ahead and add those in there. That's gonna go in the hop spider. And I like to give that a good, and you can see it's boiling over, you need to stir it real good. And you might need to even turn down your gas or even shut it off. Sometimes it, you may even need to actually pick up your kettle if needed to get that to really settle down. But you can see why that firm cap is really uh, helpful because it'll help prevent those boil overs. And so th that's a lot of the reason why I don't like to do it on the inside and I like to do this outside, uh, even in a garage, so that doesn't happen. But I'm gonna go ahead and give the hops in here a good stir too. Basically just letting the oils out into the boil without letting any of the hot material. So uh, we'll let that go ahead and start for 60 minutes. And at 30 minutes, we're gonna add our second hop addition. So we'll see you back then. All right, it's time for addition number two. At 30 minutes, this is Herzbrucker. It's gonna be one ounce, 30 minutes. It's going in. I'm gonna put that in again into my hop spider. I'm gonna give it a good stir both in the regular pot and in the hop spider itself. Move that around a little bit. And again, keep an eye on that because it can boil over, but it's less likely to do that after the first time. Um, You'll want to also just periodically boil or um, stir your pot every once in a while. You don't have to do it, you know, every five minutes or anything, but you're going to want to stir this 
every once in a while make sure that the hot matter is moving around in there, make sure the oils are getting out of there. Um, in this case, we have um, one more hop addition that's at flame out. So right as we are shutting off the burner, we're gonna dump in our last two ounces of Saz hops. And uh, at 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, dump in a Warflock tablet. And this is just to help clarify the beer. This is optional. This is something if you want clearer beer, some people don't care. Um, this also has a lot of uh, white weed in it, so it'll be a little cloudier anyway. But uh, this just helps kind of drop out any particular matter. But this is optional. I just like to do that on most of my beers. Uh, unless it's supposed to be like a hazy or something, but even then it really doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to throw one of those in at 15 minutes. Another thing that you'll want to start doing now is to sanitize or um, clean your wort chiller. So I have mine all sanitized in a rubber blade container over there. Some people like to stick it right in their wort at uh, 15 minutes because the boil will kill that off. I don't do that. I just sanitize it real good after it's been cleaned real good. Um, and then I just put it in right as the boil gets finished um, and I hook it up to my hose. But we will be back to add the last hop addition at flame out and then go through the whole cooling process with the wort chiller. So that's next. All right, I got a wort flock tablet. The uh, directions say to crush this. No need to do that. Just go ahead and toss it right in there. Um, doesn't need to go in the hop spider, it can go in the main portion, but also again, it can foam up a little bit. So you wanna make sure that you're taking a look at that when you throw that in there, but that'll dissolve uh, very easily. All right, that's two hop additions going in. This is the first ounce of size. Second ounce. Sometimes when you use one of these hop spiders, there's a little bit of, you know, a question mark of whether they allow all the hop oils to get out right away. So I like to let it boil until it basically, you can tell that the hop oils have gotten into the main kettle. Um, you can also periodically, which I've done, and I just didn't show it, you can periodically lift this thing up a couple times and let the, let the fluid out of it because it gets kind of sometimes a little bit stuck up in the, the screen. Uh, it's not too bad, but I, I do that a few times just to make sure that all those hop oils are getting out into the beer itself. So we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna cut this off. I'm gonna shut that all the way off. I'm gonna take the kettle. I'm gonna put it down here on the ground. And then I'm going to put my immersion chiller inside of this and start the water right away. So go ahead and throw that guy right in there. I'm going to start the water. And I'm going to put the hot spider right in the middle of it. Um, if you don't use a hot spider, no big deal. Um, that's not a big deal. But what this is going to do is it's going to take the cold water inside. It's going to twirl it around through here and it's going to come out super hot on the other side and that's just draining out to my driveway right now. I'll get a closer up look. I do move this around a little bit in here so you can, uh, so it moves the, the volume of water around and uh, I'll show you what that looks like. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm kind of rocking the wort chiller back and forth in there. It's kind of keeping the, wort, the uh, wort moving around around the wort chiller so it doesn't just stay in one spot. As you can tell, boiling on this uh, thermometer was way down here. It's already come up to under 160 degrees in just a couple of minutes. And so we're gonna just keep rocking this back and forth. And it depends how cold your groundwater is at the time, depending on how long this will take. But I've had this as little as 10 to 15 minutes down to pitching temperature. Um, and then, uh, you know, during the summertime or, you know, it's in spring right now, we're at 70 to 80 degree weather right now. It's going to take a few more minutes, but really what I'm gauging is trying to get this as quickly as I can down to about 80 degrees or less. And then I'm going to start um, getting this into my fermenter and eat all that movement will lower that temperature even more. But ideally we want to be under 80 degrees or 75 degrees is even better. And before we pitch our wort, we want to be at pitching range based on the uh, yeast that you're using. And the yeast that we're using from Bell's 
calls for uh, pitching temperature between uh, 72 and 68 is fermentation um, temperature. So we don't want to pitch higher than that because if we do that, you can start getting off flavors in your beer and things. So we really want to cool this down as much as we can uh, right now with the wort chiller. And then it will make it a lot easier and you'll have to wait a lot loss, less before you pitch your beer. So, or pitch your yeast, I mean. So we're going to go ahead and just every once in a while, just give this a good rock and then let the water do its thing. Again, it's already almost at 120 degrees. And once it gets under 80, uh, we can go ahead and transfer it into our fermenter and pitch our yeast. All right, our wort is chilled to under 80 degrees. It's at about 78-ish or so. And the rest of the time it'll cool down by getting into other vessels that are a little bit cooler than that. So I took it off the wort chiller. It's sitting here, I've hooked up another uh, sanitized hose again super important to sanitize everything especially after the boil because anything this touches can uh, get bacteria introduced to it and it won't allow your yeast to take hold and instead you can get bacteria in there so sanitized hose sanitized fermenter clean sanitized and then i have a uh, a uh, screen that i use and this kind of serves two purposes it it aerates the beer as it goes in and it will also catch any other uh, hot particles and stuff like that before it gets into there, which again isn't a big deal. You can throw all those hot particles right into the fermenter. Those will settle out with your first batch. Um, if you didn't use a um, if you didn't use a hop spider or something to catch the hot particles, don't worry about it. That can go right in your bucket, right in your fermenter. In this case, I'm using a big mouth bubbler, but you can also use one of these screens. I did that for a long time, even with a bucket, a bigger screen to catch a lot of the hot particles. Um, you can stop your valve, you can uh, pour out uh, or get all the, the uh, liquid into there and then kind of empty the screen if it fills up with hot material. Um, but that's, again, optional. You can leave it right in there. I just like to get it out. I think it helps for clearer beer. Um, the second thing this screen does is aerate the beer. So you want oxygen in your wort to help the uh, fermentation process. And so... What this screen also does is gets a lot of oxygen. As the wort's going through there, it's kind of breaking up the stream and, and providing a lot of oxygen um, to the wort itself. So after I get this done, it's gonna be just full of oxygen and bubbles and that kind of stuff. And uh, rather than having to shake it or aerate it with a different utensil, I can go ahead and just pitch my yeast because it's gonna be uh, oxygenated enough. If you're using a bucket and you're not using a screen like that, that's fine too. Um, you can just go ahead and you can just go ahead and take your bucket, put the lid on it, put your thumb over the hole where your uh, airlock would go, and just shake it really, really good. That'll also help aerate it. That's what I used to do when I first got started. I'm tipping it because I'm getting to the last of the uh, of the kettle here, making sure I get everything in here, all the liquid I can. Most of the hot material, again, is not in here because I use the hop spider. So I try to get as much as I possibly can in here out of the, the kettle, but that'll do it right there. So I'm gonna take that guy off. I'm gonna take my screen out. It did catch some. Uh, hot particles and stuff like that. Not a ton, because I use the hop spider. And that's the benefit of using a hop spider, is that it catches a lot of that material. But now I can go ahead and I can get my lid on here, which I have sanitized. I also use a, a tilt hydrometer, and that's this guy here. That's hope for a whole different video, but this will also, I'm gonna throw it back in the sanitizer for a minute before I throw it in the beer. But what that does is it gives me a hydrometer reading as it's fermenting and a temperature reading. So um, it's it's not 100% accurate, but it's very close and it gives me an idea of when fermentation actually ends. But that's for a different video. I just use it, so I'm gonna go ahead and throw that guy right in there now. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put that slit on there. I also use, and I haven't pitched my yeast yet, which I'm gonna do in a minute, uh, and we'll do that uh, once I put it in my fermentation chamber. I also use a blow-off tube for all of it. This is also where you can put an airlock on the top. 
Um, if you're using a bucket, you would use one of those airlocks, either the S or the cap style airlock. Um, but I just use a blow off tube for everything in case it really has a, a big fermentation. This one I don't expect to happen, but I just use them for everything now because it's easier. But I'll show you what that looks like once we get this in my fermentation chamber. Um, you can also just put this in a cooler bedroom or in a basement if you have one, somewhere where the temperature is going to be the most regulated um, and closer to the fermentation temperatures that are expected for your yeast. In this case, we want it somewhere between 68 and 72 degrees. You do not want it warmer than that. And keep in mind that when it's fermenting, it actually warms up the beer. It has heat involved with the chemical reactions and stuff that are going on inside here. So make sure that you're putting it somewhere cool. That's the most important part of, of home brewing. So if I had to tell you one tip and one takeaway is fermentation temperature is super important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we pitch the yeast next. All right, we're in our fermentation chamber here. This is just an old chest freezer that I use. Um, I'll point out a few things in here, but that's kind of for a different video. Um, this is a small chest freezer that I have a um, temperature controller on. I have my fermentation chamber sits on the bottom. There is a heat lamp in here for a lizard. It's a ceramic heat lamp. It actually doesn't have a, a light bulb in it. It's a ceramic lamp as if you had a uh, for aquatic and get it at like a pet store. This is a dehumidifier. Um, you can plug it in and kind of re reuse it so it doesn't get too humid and a lot of moisture in here. And then I have a little glass, uh, a jar of sanitizer here, which my blow off tube is gonna connect to the uh, top of the fermenter and then get inside of that to create the airlock rather than the regular airlock, but you can use that as, as well. There's a little cord that comes from this that I attach to the side of the fermenter and that reads the temperature. So the refrigerator knows when to kick on cold or the lamp knows when to kick on hot to keep it at the right temperature. So I'm gonna set this for 68 degrees, which is what it calls for on the um, yeast from 68 to 72, but we're gonna put it at 68. I like a little on the colder side, typically. Um, I'm also gonna take my last hydrometer reading. Um, and for this, I can use the refractometer before fermentation. So I'm just go ahead, I'm gonna take a little sample of that. I have a sanitized syringe here. All you need is a little bit of volume in that. I'm gonna save that, put that off to the side and we'll do the uh, refractometer reading for our original gravity or starting gravity. And then we are going to pitch the yeast right now too. So I'll set that off to the side. In my previous video that I did, we have our yeast here. This is the uh, yeast that we harvested from the Bell's Oberon. Um, if you haven't watched that video and then, uh, or if you just made a starter or just pitching your liquid or dry yeast, this is when you would do that now. Um, and so my beer is sitting at about 70 degrees or so. Um, and so it's only a couple of degrees away from, from and it's well within the fermentation temperature range. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I swirl it around, make sure I get all the yeast from that was stuck on the bottom of this flask. Make sure I get that good and, and stirred up. And then I'm gonna take this lid off and I'm gonna dump this guy right in there. So again, give it a good swirl and then dump it right inside. Getting all that in there. Then I'm gonna re-sanitize the lid here. So I'm gonna use my spray sanitizer. I'm gonna spray that, off, that lid off real good, make sure that's all killed bacteria. Got my tilt hydrometer in there already, so that's ready to go. I'm gonna squeeze that on real tight. And then I have, last but not least, I have my airlock, which is basically a piece of tubing and a bung that has the tubing inside of it. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and squeeze this on the top here. Put that right on top of, fits right in that hole. Make sure that's good and tight. I still have a little bit left to go in there. There we go. Make sure it's good and tight. And then I'm gonna put the other side right inside of my um, blow off tube, uh, or excuse me, in the sanitizer here, and that creates a blow off tube. Now, if I was doing a really big beer 
and I was afraid that um, the fermentation foam would get up and it would be a really high active uh, fermentation that would just blow off some of that uh, fermentation into through the tube and into the sanitized jar over there. And I do this for everything, even though I don't expect that to happen with this one. But just uh, in case, you could do that if you think you're going to have a really high gravity beer or something that's going to have a high fermentation rate or um, take off real fast. In this case, uh, I think you could get away just fine with just a regular airlock. So with that, it's ready to go. It's fermenting. We're going to go ahead and close the fermentation chamber and we're gonna wait and let this fully ferment out. It should take about a week. All right, time for the last final gravity reading. We're gonna again use the refractometer. I have a little bit of the wart that we were able to pull out right before we pitched the yeast. This is gonna be the uh, original gravity or starting gravity reading. I, I kind of like to call the pre-boil the starting gravity, the original gravity being the post-boil gravity, and then the final gravity is always the final gravity after fermentation. So I think people refer to it differently. That's just how I use it. Um, so we're gonna put a couple drops on this, on the refractometer screen again, on this blue area. Just a couple of drops is all. I'm gonna go ahead and close the screen for the little glass deal there. And then we're gonna go ahead and look through there to see what our final gravity reading, or excuse me, original gravity reading is. And according to our according to our uh, um, sheet, we, our expected gravity, expected final or, uh, original gravity was supposed to be 1056 or 1.056, and we are just a little bit over that, which is which means it's going to be just a little bit higher uh, alcohol content. It looks like I'm right at zero or 1.059. So um, that's that's probably fine. It means the volume boiled down a little bit more, and uh, and so we have a little bit more of a concentrated beer. Um, I'm okay with that. It's a couple points. It's not going to be much different for ABV. All right, everybody, that wraps up our how to brew video. I hope you guys learned a lot. If you have any questions, comments things that I might have missed, please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer the questions as best I can. Um, please like, subscribe, and share to get future videos that I'm planning on doing, uh, all about teaching people how to brew better beer. With that, cheers, and we'll see you next time.